At first I thought that my colleagues stuck me with this introduction because I'm the only member of our city council who also happens to be a lawyer by profession. Uh, but as I made my way through this well-written and fascinating account of Justice Brennan's career, I was pleasantly surprised to discover powerful themes that resonated with me. Brennan repeatedly found himself in the middle of eras dominated by larger-than-life personalities, Joe McCarthy, uh, Lyndon Johnson, and others of that sort. His great ability was that he could hold his ground with these figures without having to be like these figures. In his court decisions, Brennan cared less about eloquent writing than about making sure justice was served. In his interactions with his colleagues, he nurtured relationships and camaraderie. Rather than grandstanding, he exhibited a calm, deliberative, pragmatic approach to his public service, and he valued consensus. Now, without making too much of a leap in comparison, that same spirit of thoughtful leadership and quiet problem solving, of eschewing the cheap point scoring politics of the day, is what makes me so proud of the work of our city government and our city council right here in Gaithersburg. By focusing on the practical instead of the lofty, on the real life implications instead of the theory, Brennan was an extremely effective leader on the court in moving incrementally over the course of a 34 year tenure to solidify so many rights that we take for granted today. From equal treatment, to personal privacy, to freedom of speech. And of course, Brennan's father was a beloved city commissioner in Newark, New Jersey, who also practiced that same brand of thoughtful, results-oriented service to the public. So this book is particularly appropriate to celebrate at the Gaithersburg Book Festival. Seth Stern is a legal affairs reporter at Congressional Quarterly and a graduate of Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School of Government. And Stephen Wormiel worked for 12 years as the Wall Street Journal's Supreme Court reporter, and he now teaches at American University Washington College of Law, where he also received his law degree. Both of them live right here in Maryland. And I want to thank our two esteemed co-authors for being here today. And without further ado, I invite them to share their insights on the accomplishment that is this book. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming out today. Um, we're going to talk about Justice Brennan, liberal champion, take you back to 1956 when William J. Brennan Jr. was nominated to the Supreme Court by President Eisenhower. At the time, Brennan was a rather obscure state Supreme Court justice in New Jersey and former corporate labor lawyer. People really didn't know about him when he was named. He was really a question mark. And yet, during the course of the 34 terms he served on the Supreme Court, he proved to be perhaps the most influential justice of the 20th century. And that's not our opinion, but rather that of Antonin Scalia, his colleague on the court, with whom he agreed about very little. His influence was felt in a, a remarkably broad area of law, from affirmative action and abortion school prayer and school desegregation, uh, the rights of criminal defendants and the death penalty, women's rights and welfare rights. And what's remarkable is that that influence was not just under his uh, close ally and colleague, Chief Justice Oral Warren, but also under Warren's two more conservative successors, Warren Berger and William Rehnquist. Now in 1986, Justice Brennan was celebrating his 30th year on the court, and he turned 80 that year. And that was the year that he turned to Steve. Uh, and Steve's going to talk a little bit about how he came to be the, his biographer. Thanks, and, and welcome, everybody. We're, we're delighted to have the chance to be here. Um, so in 1986, I had a very good friend who was then the chief judge of the US Court of Appeals in Washington. Uh, a man named Abner Mikva. And he also was very good friends with Justice Brennan. And I would have breakfast with Judge Mikva once in a while. I was working at the Wall Street Journal. Had never met Justice Brennan. Uh, and Judge Mikva said, how'd you like to write a book about the court? And I very quickly said, no. Uh, 
Um, but here we are. Um, it, it turned out, to give you the short version of the story, um, that Justice Brennan, because of his anniversary on the court and birthday, was looking for a biographer. I didn't know that. They sort of let me believe that I was going to go convince Justice Brennan that he should break 30 years of silence and cooperate with a biographer and tell all. Uh, and so I thought this was kind of an interesting challenge. How would I go sell him on this idea and on me being the person with whom he would do this? And I prepared for months and months for this meeting with him, uh, thinking that it really would have to be like a, a scholarly sales pitch about how we would proceed and what we would cover and, and so on. And I walked into that meeting in June 1986, and he came out from behind his big desk and said, Steve, I'm ready to start. How about you? So how do you like my sales pitch? That, that was it. Um, I never got to give it. And he began cooperating very generously with his time. I ended up doing about 60 hours of tape-recorded interviews with him. He opened up all of his files and papers. Um, and for the first four years, the, the, his last four years on the bench, he wanted the book to be a secret, essentially. He was afraid that if other justices knew that I was meeting regularly with him, that it would affect his relationship with them, that they would be less willing to, to talk to him about cases and so on. And he didn't want that. So we kept it a secret which made for a very interesting dynamic for me. Um, what I discovered quickly was that the way this book was going to unfold was he came to work at 7 a.m. every morning. And I needed to start my Wall Street Journal job at 9 a.m. every day. So you can figure out what's coming. Um, basically, I got to the court at 7 o'clock every morning. He made an arrangement with the Supreme Court police force that if I wanted to come up and work in his chambers, I would just go into the office of the police sergeant, and they would call upstairs and say, Steve's here. And he would say, OK, send him up or not. And I would sneak up the back stairs with the police officer, and some days interview Justice Brennan, other days work in his files and papers and so on. And it was a remarkable opportunity to really learn about the workings of the institution. Um, let me just say one word about the resources he made available, and then I'll turn it back to Seth. Um, most justices will have two sets of files in their offices, what they call the case files, which it, it contain the, the draft opinions and exchanges of memos among the justices, and then a correspondence file, which is basically as it sounds. Um, Justice Brennan had both of those uh, in large volume, but also had a third set of files, which was a remarkable and, and fascinating resource. Beginning in 1960, so for 30 of his 34 years on the court, he had his law clerks at the end of every court term write a narrative account, like a novel about what went on behind the scenes in all of the major cases of the term, literally blow-by-blow blow descriptions. And he made those available to me as well. Um, they are both fascinating and problematic. Um, they're fascinating because they, they contain an incredible amount of, of detail that is not available anywhere else about Brennan's time on the court or has never existed in any other period in the court's history. Um, when one justice goes to discuss a case with another justice, there's no record of that anywhere. When one justice calls another justice, there's really no record of that anywhere. So these Brennan histories contain that kind of narrative, which adds a richness of detail, which we hope the book has captured. The problematic part of the histories is that the law clerks um, were not, uh, di didn't feel bound by any constraints about direct observation. So the histories will contain passages like Justice Brennan learned from his law clerks that they had heard from Justice Powell's law clerks that Justice Powell had heard 
that Justice White was thinking about changing his vote in a case. Now, you don't really have to be a trained historian to know that it would be hard to establish all of that as fact, as true, um, because there are so many players and so many steps in the process. So we've tried to be, uh, if you'll pardon the term, judicious in our use of the, of the histories and, and use them to the extent that we really felt that it was a, a, a compelling part of the narrative and that we could really establish the truth of some of these assertions. Having said that, they really were a remarkable and rich resource that, that is unparalleled in the history of the court. I should say that Steve is uh, being a little modest of, about the experience that he was he had and the access that he was granted, which really is without any precedent in the history of the court. No justice has ever granted a journalist or a historian essentially complete access to his chambers. Steve could sit in, in the, on the morning coffees that Justice Brennan would have with his clerks in the morning and they would talk about the, the news of the day or pending cases. And it got to the point where Steve would be standing at the photocopier, photocopying material from any of the files he wanted, and sitting next to the copier would be a draft opinion in a case that hadn't been announced yet. And uh, Steve never took advantage of that. He kept his role as a reporter and his role as biographer separate. But it speaks to the uh, tremendous faith that Justice Brennan had in him and the, the access that he had been granted. Now, I joined Steve in 2006 uh, and had worked on the book for about four years, and it was published in uh, 2010, last fall, in October. And I thought I would just talk about a couple of the key themes, the discoveries that we made and the, that we explore in the book. One of them, the most fascinating, really, is the contrast between Justice Brennan, the liberal justice, and the much more conservative man. And we saw that on things like press freedom, where he was the great champion of the press and his decisions, and yet really distrusted reporters. There's no one that he would curse about uh, in his interviews with Steve or who would infuriate him more than journalists. We saw that on the area of abortion, where he wrote some of the key privacy precedents of the 1960s and 70s that made Roe versus Wade possible, and he helped craft the opinion that uh, Justice Harry Blackman wrote in that case, and yet he made clear to Steve uh, that he was uncomfortable with abortion, and if his daughter had wanted to have one, uh, he, he, he would have been uncomfortable with that idea. The area where it's really most striking, this contrast, is on women's rights, where he wrote many of the key decisions, the landmark decisions of the 1970s, and yet he uh, admitted to his clerks in the late 60s that he was uncomfortable with the idea of a female colleague. And in the 1970s, at a time when his, uh, his clerks, every justice now has four in that era, uh, they had two, and then it went up to three, and then four. Uh, his former clerks would recommend uh, clerks to him. And they called him up, two of them in 1970, who were teaching at the law school at the University of California, Berkeley. They suggested a female clerk. And he said, all they had to say was the name. And, and he said, send me someone else. He was uncomfortable with the idea of a woman serving in his chambers. Four years later, after he had written some of the landmark decisions, including one where he said to put women on a pedestal is to really put them on a cage, one of those professors again, his name was Stephen Barnett, wrote Brennan and said, for a, uh, called Brennan, excuse me, and a second time said, I have another a great candidate for you. And again, as soon as he said the name and it was a woman, Brennan said, "Someone, send me someone else. But that time, instead of backing off and recommending a man, uh, Stephen Barnett wrote Brennan a letter. And it's an amazing letter in which he said, essentially, Justice Brennan, you're a hypocrite. And not only are you a hypocrite, but you could be sued under the very precedents that you helped write. And that was the point at which Justice Brennan had a change of heart hired his first uh, female clerk. Her name was Marcia Burzon, who went on to a very distinguished career herself as a lawyer and now as a judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. So the second theme I just thought I would touch upon briefly is the stereotype of Justice Brennan as this happy Irish leprechaun uh, 
The press, the press coverage of Justice Brennan dating back to the, the week, the day after his nomination, portrayed him as this, this Irishman, this ward boss, who would twist arms and shake hands as if he was a, a combination of an Irish politician and a leprechaun. And we try to show in the book that Justice Brennan's success, although he was an unusually affable and friendly man to everyone at the court, whether the elevator operator or his colleagues, the reason why he was so successful wasn't because he was affable, but rather, rather he was a uniquely skilled coalition builder who was able to build uh, uh, majorities, both when there was a liberal majority in the 1960s, but he continued to do that in the 1970s and the 1980s when the court became increasingly conservative. So with that, uh, Steve's going to touch on a little bit about his legacy, and then hopefully we'll have time for a couple questions. So I, I think we leave open sort of the question here of, of what made Justice Brennan so influential. And Seth touched on the image that was portrayed. Um, what I think we need to make clear is this, this image of Brennan as the coalition builder was in some ways almost as important to him as the substance of the decisions. I, in my view of Brennan, he had a very profound view of the meaning of the Constitution. He believed the Constitution uh, was created to protect the, the human dignity of all people. It was really about equality. It was really about facilitating participation in our democracy. It really belonged to everybody. It ought to be interpreted in a way that was meaningful for today's society and not in some fixed sense from 1787 or 1789, um, and he felt very profoundly about that. But he felt equally profoundly that if you put those views out there and didn't win, you never convinced four other justices, you weren't really accomplishing anything. And so he was as adamant about trying to compromise and, as Seth said, build coalitions around those views to the greatest extent possible uh, and, the, you know, he would, he would really work the process of compromising. Um, some of my favorite ex anecdotes that, that you see in his files, um, his, his probably the person he had to work most with in, after the Warren Court ended in 1969, Justice Lewis Powell came on the court in 1972 uh, and stayed until uh, 1987. And in that period, Lewis Powell was the swing vote, what Anthony Kennedy is described as today. Um, Lewis Powell was the person whose vote Brennan had to win most of the time in a liberal, progressive, close decision. He'd, get, he'd send a draft opinion to Powell, and he'd get these letters back that were, Powell was a, was a very courtly, you know, Richmond, um, southern gentleman. He'd write back the most charming letters, Dear Bill, I think you've done a marvelous job with this opinion, and I really compliment the way you've handled the complex issues. And I'm sure I'd be able to join you if you could see your way clear to just making a couple of small changes. And then it's a nine-page, single-spaced you know, letter that asks Brennan to essentially rewrite the entire opinion. Well, you and I might look at that letter and say, oh, there's no hope. This is never going to happen. You know, I'm, I'm desperate. I give up. Brennan would look at that letter and say, OK, we're in play. Right? This is the beginning of a discussion. If you didn't get that letter, there's no fifth vote, and you're done. You're out of the game. So as daunting as that letter might be, um, it's something to work on and work with. And so Brennan really viewed that as, as opportunity. And that's, that's in a sense, as a, a really critical part, I think, of who he was. The legacy that he left from all of that um, is really profound. You find Brennan's influence uh, in, in free speech cases today. I mean, there are two free speech cases in the Supreme Court this term, both of which are significantly influenced by Brennan. Uh, the current, to, to the extent that affirmative action still exists in higher education, it's partly a legacy of Brennan's efforts. Uh, the, the, the strength of the right to abortion uh, 
is partly a, a, a result of Brennan's support and legacy, uh, the, the controversy in our country over the death penalty and whether it's fair and can be administered in, a, in an appropriate way or whether it's flatly unconstitutional. Brennan was pivotal in that debate and his views still play a role in that discussion. Uh, Church-state separation issues, it's really still Brennan's view of separation that is, that is kind of defining one side of the debate. He was an ardent separationist. Uh, the court is certainly moving away from some of these views, uh, but Brennan's view is still very much kind of defining one side and one part of the debate uh, in, a, in a very significant way. And so it really is a very profound legacy. But again, it comes not just from the constitutional vision but also from this deep-seated belief that you really had to compromise to try to, to win a court, to win five votes. Can we open it up to questions? Yeah, or? so with that, if anyone has a question, I guess uh, they ask if you could come to the microphone and ask it there. consensus builder, would he have felt comfortable sitting on the court right now? Um, this would be a much harder court. I mean, we, even we, I think, when we talk about Brennan, even though we're trying to sort of disavow the, the, you know, the magical leprechaun image, we do still create a sense that there was something mystical about his ability to find five votes. But it's sort of self-evident if you think about it that the critical ingredient in finding five votes is that there have to be five votes there to find and I think he would have a harder time doing that in this court um, to the extent that Anthony Kennedy is the swing vote if Brennan were in the, the the liberal wing of the court and trying to pitch for Anthony Kennedy's vote that would be a much harder sell today than it was to try to persuade Lewis Powell 30 years ago, or maybe even Sandra O'Connor in the, in the early 80s. Um, we certainly could say confidently he wouldn't stop trying. Sure. The question is how much of his, his uh, judicial philosophy was shaped by his background. And uh, Justice Brennan grew up in Newark. He was the son of two Irish immigrants who grew up uh, about 10 miles apart in County Roscommon. They never would have met if they hadn't both wound up in Newark. His father was a uh, stationary fireman working in a brewery and then worked his way up through, through his union and then into city politics in Newark. And, we, we think that his father was a, a tremendous influence, the notion of economic justice. I think he really did get that from his father. But his father, as a city official, had no uh, qualms about sort of uh, cracking down on civil liberties. And that uh, Justice Brennan was very different in that regard, given his uh, being a champion of civil liberties. So his upbringing, his, his father, only tell you so much of the story. Uh, I think his, his faith as a, as a Catholic uh, also fed his uh, sense of, of justice, his notion of human dignity, but that wasn't the only influence. So in the, in the case of Justice Brennan, it's hard to say there was one influence, there was one moment that made him who he was. And he spent his career as a corporate labor lawyer and then as a judge in uh, New Jersey at every level of the court in, in, the, in the late 1940s and early 1950s before he became a justice. And I don't think that you can say, or he would even say, that at the moment he was uh, confirmed in 1957 uh, that he would become the great liberal champion. I don't think it was clear then, if you go back and read his decisions as a New Jersey judge, uh, who he was. Uh, he, he evolved some. He sort of grew into that role as liberal champion, uh, and uh, it, it, it wasn't clear from the moment that he joined the court. I would just add that I think it was somewhat circumstantial, too. He joined the court two years after Brown versus Board of Education when the South is resisting 
the, the authority of the court deeply, and Brennan is exactly the kind of person who is, is going to assume the persona of the institution. I mean, you get to the court and people are disrespecting the court and disobeying the court that you've just joined, that's not acceptable to him. He really, he really sort of takes on the mantra of defending the court and the institution and its authority and role, and I think that, that, that civil rights context is very important to his development. What did you learn about the process that transcended the man? The process of the court? The tug of, the tug of war? The, the, the I mean, in some ways, the, the, what we learned about the court, um, I, I sort of hesitate to say this, but in some ways it's less interesting than the legend, you know, the, the, you, you have the image from, from other coverage of the court and other books and works about the court um, of the justices fighting with each other and arguing with each other and, and having feuds with each other and so on. And that's really not the image that I came away with. The image I came away with is that for the most part, the court works in a relatively scholarly fashion. The justices do most of their work in writing my discussion earlier of the interesting details about phone calls and, and personal visits, uh, I would say that's 10% of the work of the court. The other 90% is written draft opinions and written memos and exchanges and, and the negotiations that take place are not as, as we might want to think of them, well, gee, are you pro-abortion or are you anti-abortion and how strongly or not it's, you know, what do these three words in the middle of this, this sentence, in your opinion, mean? And how are they going to be interpreted subsequently in some other context? And could you explain to me what you had in mind so I know whether I can support that sentence or not? And it, Um, not entirely. I guess I had sort of, uh, you know, I, I drunk the Kool-Aid and believed that the, that the court was uh, a lot about personalities and, and, and personal interaction among the justices more than I came to think it really was. Not that that's totally insignificant. I mean, the personalities matter and the personal interactions matter, um, but I think much less so than I had imagined. Yeah, please. A little off topic, but one of the issues about the federal courts today is the cameras in the courtroom. There's a discussion of legislation pending and whether to have cameras in the trial courts, in the courts of appeals, and ultimately in the Supreme Court, even though we have just about all the justices in the court that said yes. What effect do you think that might have both on the oral argument in the court and on the quality of the decision making that the cameras are allowed in? Do you think it's a good idea? Well, I, I can answer that question in the context of Justice Brennan, who had his own evolution on that uh, issue, where he was uh, somewhat reluctant in the, in the 70s and 80s with the idea. Um, he later came to embrace it. Uh, by the end of his career, he was one of the justices who did believe they should televise the proceedings. But earlier, I mean, he had concerns, and I think this is what motivates for some of the justices. They like their privacy. Justices like being able to walk down the street, even the streets around the court. Brennan liked going out and you know, saying, oh, what goes on in this building to tourists who had no idea who he was? Uh, so they like their privacy. And then there's the potential impact on the court, the proceedings, whether there's a sort of a degree of showmanship among the lawyers that would take over, and whether uh, the public would perceive it as this sort of combative institution based on the nature of oral argument rather than sort of a deliberative body that it is. So, uh, well. I, mean, I, I would just add, I share, I share that. I don't think the court would be significantly harmed by it, but to non-lawyers who look at the questions the justices ask, it would be very easy to, be, to sort of mistakenly believe that they were expressions of opinion rather than questions or rhetorical questions. Um, and I think that's a legitimate concern, but I don't think that's enough of a reason to not do it. Okay. That's it, we're, yeah. we're done? <laughs>
Thank you. Well, thank you.